this evening. I am a member of the Sioux Climate Hub and the Hub is a group, a diverse group of people from the Sioux and region. I'm on St. Joseph Island, Carter, you're down the line, who are not only concerned about climate change, but who are strongly committed to joining in climate action. And this is a presentation series so that we can introduce each other to ourselves and also to the actions that we're engaged in. And saying that then the Climate Hub exists because of its member dedication. So we have an open door policy, anyone can join, there are no fees to join, and we strongly invite you to join. Uh, to join, just go to Facebook or um, send us an email, suclimatehub at gmail.com. Please, we'd be interested to hear your ideas and to benefit from your energy in tackling climate change. This evening, we have the pleasure of hearing from Carter Darsh of the Kensington Conservancy. And Carter will be speaking of the work that the Kensington Conservancy does. But before I hand the floor over, I have a couple of things I need to do. And that is, first of all, uh, some ground housekeeping issues. Please keep your mics muted at all times, especially during Carter's presentation. Please place any questions or comments in the chat and these will be addressed near the end of the presentation. And please keep August 25th in mind. That is the schedule for our eighth presentation. We haven't confirmed our speaker yet, but I am pretty excited. I think I know who it's going to be and so it'll be wonderful. Now, I also wish to acknowledge that we are in Robinson-Huron Treaty Territory and that the land on which we are gathered is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, specifically Garden River and Batuana First Nations, as well as the Métis peoples. Second, I wish to acknowledge that at this moment, the forest fires affecting our region are an expression, a vehement expression of climate change. And right now they're having the greatest impact on our First Nations neighbors. So I believe that both this experience and the perspectives that they have uh, with regard to our relationship to nature both have never been more important than they are now. And I think we need to take pause to consider that. Now, I didn't um, share my screen, so I will do that now. David Attenberg, in his recent movie, A Life on Our Planet, explained that the disaster of climate change can be reversed if we rewild the planet. And I thought that was a really compelling concept, rewilding the planet. I think that conservation of sensitive ecosystems is the beginning of allowing nature to rewild the planet. And with that comment, I'm going to now hand it to Carter. And I thank you. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me along here to this evening. I'm just going to get my screen shared here. So tonight I'm going to be talking about the conservation work of the Kensington Conservancy. Uh, my name is Carter Dorscht and I am the executive director of the Conservancy. So um, the Kensington Conservancy is a land trust. And if you've never heard of a land trust, um, they're typically nonprofit organizations which own and manage land. 
There's a few different reasons that um, an organization may want to do this. Um, besides the conservation land trust type that we are, um, there's land trusts that acquire land for affordable housing. Um, that's very popular in some cities. But we, what we do is conservation work. So a conservation land trust is a private nonprofit corporation that acquires land or conservation easements for the purpose of limiting commercial development and preserving open spaces, natural areas, waterways, and slash or productive farms and forests. So in a nutshell, we uh, protect land so that they can uh, be conserved forever. So the Kensington Conservancy itself, um, the idea for it began back in the 1990s. Um, my understanding is that Stobie Creek wetland, which is located just um, east of Deborah, Ontario, um, was there is a proposal to fill it in and turn it into a trailer park. And it's um, a provincially significant wetland and I'm sure everyone understands that wetlands are important for the environment. So filling it in and turning it into a trailer park wouldn't be a good idea. So um, a group of individuals in the area got together and they kind of uh, you know, fought against this. And it never went through, but they decided that in the future they'd be more um, proactive when it comes to conservation instead of reactive. So it took a while, like a lot of things, there's a lot of paperwork involved. So um, the Kensington Conservancy became incorporated as a nonprofit organization in 2001. And then it took another five years to get our registered charity status. That happened in 2006. The big benefit of being a registered charity um, is that you're able to issue tax receipts for any donations. Nonprofit organizations cannot. Um, as many of our members are American, we also have um, the Kensington Conservancy incorporated in the United States as a 501c3, which is the US equivalent of a registered charity. That way, um, those with US incomes are able to get tax receipts um, for them in the United States as well. So our mission, as most um, or all nonprofit organizations have, statement. Ours is the mission of the Kensington Conservancy is the establishment, development, maintenance, and management of nature reserves and programs in the St. Joseph Channel for the conservation and preservation of the natural ecosystems. So all of the work that we do, um, we try to tie back into this mission statement. If you're not familiar with the St. Joseph Channel area, it's um, just, you know, maybe half an hour 20 minutes, half hour east of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, I have a map of our area later on in this presentation that might give you a little bit better idea of where the St. Joseph Channel is. So how are we funded? Almost all of our operating budget each year comes from private donations from our local community. So we really rely on the generosity of our community to do the um, conservation work that we do. Um, we have memberships each year that only cost $35. So if you're interested, um, definitely sign up. And then we do um, campaigns throughout the year to raise money on top of that. We also have um, some businesses and local, local organizations that sponsor us. And we do apply for government and private grants, but usually these grants only cover specific projects and it's uh, hard to offset our operating budget strictly from these grants. So that's why our the no donations that we get are very important. So just um, a few little stats to start off here. We have just over 920 acres of protected property within the St. Joseph Channel area. That's across 10 different nature preserves and one conservation easement. I'll get into a little more detail about what a conservation easement is a little on, a little later. Um, that those nature preserves in the conservation easement have over 12,000 feet of protected shoreline. We protect two um, portions of two provincially significant wetlands. Um, provincially significant wetlands are wetlands that have been evaluated by professionals and have been determined to be more important than other ones. Um, either they have more biodiversity, um, the community uses them more, there are more risk to development, those kind of things. So it's extra important to keep these wetlands protected. We have recorded over 1,100 different species of um, flora and fauna, which is fancy for wildlife and plants on our protected properties. 
and there's still hundreds and probably thousands more to uh, left to be found. So um, we're always working at adding more. And as of right now, we have just over 230 members for 2021 of the Conservancy. So we have, um, as I said earlier, I am the executive director of the Kensington Conservancy, but we also have right now, which might be tied for a record high, um, six staff members in total. Angela Charbonneau is our office manager. And then um, Corinne Wilkerson is our land stewardship coordinator. She's in charge of all our nature preserves and all the work that happens on them. John Rankin, our, uh, he's a species at risk field technician. We actually have a grant right now to do some species at risk inventory work on one of our nature preserves. So he's doing that. And then we have two summer students this year, Rachel and Vince as our assistant field technicians. Here's a picture of um, Rachel, Corrine and Vince. The other day they went for a paddle to check out a property. And they had lots of fun doing it. I love this photo that they got. So I'm gonna start out by talking about what the land conservation process is. So how we acquire properties and protect them. So to start, we have initial contact with the landowner. Either this is a landowner coming to us and saying, hey, I want to donate or I want to sell you a property. Or it's us approaching somebody and saying, hey, we want to buy your property. That's typically when it's you know, for, listed for sale. And then um, negotiations go on and we kind of come to uh, an understanding of what the property is and how it, it needs to be protected. So then we do a preliminary project summary where staff go out and they determine, you know, how much biodiversity is on the property, if, you know, what the conservation values are, where it's located, how difficult it is to access, how much money it's going to cost to acquire or maintain each year, um, if there's any risks involved that we might not want it, those kind of things. And then we bring that information to our land secure committee, which is um, a committee made up of some of our board members. And then they, you know, discuss, they might have more questions, they might want more information, but when, you know, everything's figured out, they vote on um, whether they want to recommend it to the full board to acquire or not. And then regardless of the vote, the information is brought to our full board of directors and they vote whether to proceed with the acquisition of the property or not. If, um, the board does want to get the property and it's approved, then the transaction process begins. We you know, talk to the lawyers, get legal documents together, do surveys, title searches, all that kind of stuff. And then right before the deal is about to go through, the board votes again to approve the final transaction details. And then the transaction is completed and we've successfully protected a brand new property. So we send out thank yous, especially if it's a property that was donated to us and do all the necessary announcements on our website, social media, and news releases, et cetera. So when it comes to protecting properties, we have a strategic approach of what kind of properties we wanna protect. Um, there's the ecological value of the property, the community value of the property, the location value, and then we of course have to take um, finances into consideration. So for the ecological value, we want to acquire properties that have good wildlife habitat. Um, any large undeveloped piece of property likely has some good wildlife habitat and biodiversity. And, um, and then wetlands, as I said before, we all know why they're important. So if a property has a lot of wetlands on it, that's, uh, that's uh, some good check marks to the value of the property. Shoreline. Again, um, helps you know maintain clean waterways, um, biodiversity along the shoreline too. Um, species at risk. If there is a species at risk that is known to be on the property, then that's another reason why we would want to acquire it. Um, one example is um, the red side dace, which is a minnow species that is endangered in Ontario. And the only place it's found in northern Ontario is the Two Tree River on St. Joseph Island. So if we were to able we're able to acquire um, pieces of property along the Tree River, then that um, is really good. And then scientific use, if property has potential to be used by either ourselves 
or other like-minded organizations for scientific work, then that would be of interest. Sioux College comes down to our properties every year to do um, deer browse surveys. And then if there's other organizations like Algoma U, Lake State, you know, the MNRF that wanted to use potential property for science, then we'd uh, look into acquiring it. Then the community value. So if uh, a property has hiking trails or the capability of having hiking trails created, then that is a really good reason why we'd want to acquire a property. Um, there's, you know, in the, our area, there is a lack of hiking trails for people to use. So if we're able to provide that value to the community, then that would be good. And um, scenic views, same kind of thing. If there's, you know, a rock face cliff that has a magnificent view over the water that um, everyone enjoys watching the sunset or sunrise and we're able to protect it to keep that scenic view forever and for the community to use, then that's, that's a plus. So next is location value. We want to get properties that are either right beside or very close to our other existing preserves. Continuous tracks of protected land are important to wildlife as they're able to then move more freely. One of the big issues that wildlife face is habitat fragmentation, um, where you know highways, fences, development, they limit um, the areas that these you know wildlife species, especially large, large game mammals, um, can move freely. And we of course want properties that are in close proximity to the Kensington Conservation Center, which is where we're based out of in Deborah. We don't want to drive 500 kilometers just to be able to maintain a single property. So the closer, the better. And then access. So if a property is very hard to get to, let's say it's a landlocked piece of land that you are only able to helicopter into without trespassing and there's no way to um, get over those nearby properties, then that's not going to be very convenient for us. So we have to take how easy it is to get to into consideration. And then financial considerations, if it's property that we're purchasing, we of course have to be able to either afford it or be able to fundraise or think we're gonna be able to fundraise successfully in order to buy it. And actually as part of the Ontario Land Trust Alliance's standards and practices, land trusts are not allowed to pay above fair market value for a property. Um, that kind of prevents us from getting into bidding wars and paying way more than we should when we're using uh, donations. And then stewardship costs each year, it costs money to maintain these properties, staff time to go out and inspect them, any kind of work that needs to be done on them. So we have to take into consideration how much money that's gonna cost each year. So I'm gonna very quickly go through the acquisition history of our current um, nature preserves and conservation easements. The Dawson Island Preserve, this is a small little uh, three and a half acre lot on Dawson Island. And uh, it was donated to us to keep that entire eastern shoreline undeveloped. It was the last remaining lot that could be built. The surrounding area is all crown land. Um, Phelps Preserve, this was donated by the Phelps family in 2007. This is actually located on Campador Island off the northeast corner of St. Joseph Island. This again was kind of the same idea. It was the last buildable lot along the shoreline and they wanted to main, make sure that the shoreline remained undeveloped. The Archibald Homestead, this was the first property that was purchased by the Kensington Conservancy. This is um, our furthest east property right now. 70 acres in size, it was an old farm that had gone into disrepair. It was no longer being actively farmed and then said there was falling down buildings, private garbage dumps, rotting trailers, and uh, the property came up for sale. So we acquired it and we did uh, $65,000 worth of environmental cleanup and planted 20,000 or 25,000 trees on it. And uh, it's uh, turned into a much nicer property now. Stobie Creek Preserve. So this is where I talk about where there's you know, the idea of filling it in for a trailer park. We own the west half of the creek mouth and it's about 85 acres in total. So we have half of the provincial significant wetland there. 
the Foster Parkland walking trails. This was donated to us by Maurice and Janet Foster in 2009. This was our only property that we've acquired through the ecological gift program so far, which I will get into in a bit. Um, this property came with about a kilometer's worth of hiking trails on it already. So, and they were left open to the pub for the public to use. Black Hole Preserve. This is my favorite one. It's uh, just over 200 acres right across from Smith Road, west of Deborah. It's uh, that wetland that you see on the map there is part of the Kensington Complex, which is the other provincially significant wetland in the area. And the biodiversity in there is amazing. Um, we actually offer free guided tours into our properties and most of the time I take people into this one. So if you're interested, let me know and you can check it out for yourself. Um, the Ripple Rock Preserve, this was donated to us in 2012. When you're heading, if you're coming from like Sault Ste. Marie area and heading east towards Deborah, just before you get to the high school and the curve before it there, we own both sides of the highway there on the right hand side is that wetland um, that you'll probably recognize next time you go by. Hole in the wall in the fishnet island easement. So these are two different properties, but they both fall under the same um, conservation easement agreement. Um, the hole in the wall is this unique kind of channel that comes up into a circle here. That's how it's got the name hole in the wall. It's pretty cool if you uh, are ever out in a boat and haven't been up there before, go in there and check it out. The Lang Family Preserve, this is a small 8.7 acre property. It's weirdly shaped as well. I guess the reasoning for this was to protect the wetland out here because if you had wanted to develop it, you had to cross this property, which they would then say, no, you can't do that. So effectively protecting more of the wetland than is actually on the property. And then this is our second purchase, the Boyer Preserve, right beside the Foster Parkland and walking trails. We purchased this in 2006. We received a $100,000 grant from the Nutrition Conservancy of Canada to go towards this purchase. And then we were actually able to get a loan and then from the conservation fund for the remaining, which we had planned on doing a big fundraiser to pay it off. But then we actually got a very generous um, bequest from Pam Bent and we were able to pay off the property as well as build the Kensington Conservation Center on this property, which is where we now work out of. And then last, we have the Coatsworth Island Preserve, which was purchased as well. We purchased the uh, 2019 and then just this past winter in February we were able to close the deal on the east half of the island so we have it all now and uh, the purchases were made possible from the extended Wells family and the Phelps family. So those are the properties that we currently protect. Um, here's a neat little infographic of some of the biodiversity on our preserves. We've got almost this is I screenshot this a few days ago, so it's a little out of date, but we have just over 1100 now different species of uh, plants and wildlife that have been recorded on our properties. Here's a breakdown, you know, almost half of them plants, another good chunk insects, and then quite a few birds. Then we got some mammals, fungi, and then here we got fish, reptiles, and some other more obscure taxa. And then this is just a breakdown of how um, the biodiversity based on these species from each of our properties. The Boyer Preserve does have the most species, but part of that factors in that we're there the most as that's where our uh, the Kensington Conservation Center is located. So we do rack up more species. I'm sure if our office was on the Black Hole Preserve, that number would be way higher as we spend more time there like we do on the Boyer Preserve. So, each year we have to monitor our properties minimum once a year in order to ensure that they continue to be in good ecological health. For disturbances such as invasive species, fires, flooding, or other natural disturbances, unauthorized uses, um, we don't let people camp on our properties, we don't let them use ATV, let hunt, allow hunting or any other type of resource harvesting. So we make sure that that's not happening. And then we also look for new species of flora and fauna to add to our property species lists. 
So each property, every time we acquire one, they get a baseline documentation report, which is this fancy document that you see here. Um, a baseline documentation report is a snapshot in time of the conditions of a property when it's acquired. Um, these are legally required for conservation easements, but not for fee simple properties, the ones that we own, but uh, they're still very valuable to have. It, uh, we, and we use the Ontario Land Trust Alliance template for creating these. They have a lot of information about the property, like where it's located, its legal name, legal description, um, you know, acreage, shore frontage, all other kinds of stats. It has, you know, a good description of the biodiversity of the property. It includes the legal documents that are associated with it, maps, um, species lists, and all, photos, all kinds of information that kind of give you a, an idea of what the property was like when it was acquired. That way down the road years from now, um, future staff can look at these and kind of see how things are changing over time. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. This is a, um, a description of the things included. So the same things I just went over. Then we also have a management plan for each of our properties. Um, a management plan is actually required for each property that we own. Um, it includes background information on the conservancy, the, how the property was acquired, um, the property's description and some maps associated with it. And the big part is our management goals and objectives. So we're lucky most of our properties come to us in good ecological health. So the main management goals are to, you know, let nature take its course. But there are some properties where there's known um, invasive species. So we kind of outline what invasive species to look for and how to take care of them if found. It, it also includes species lists. And that's where we keep completed copies of our monitoring forms for each year. So um, overall, we do have a land securement strategy, which guides us into how we want to protect land. So the first one was created in 2012 and it identified potential acquisitions within our original focus area. But then in 2019, we updated our land securement strategy and we also included an expanded area of focus, which um, includes both existing and new potential acquisitions. And here is the map that I talked about earlier. This is our focus area. Um, it include the north boundary here is Government Road over to Boundary Road and then on the west side, the Canada-US border, to about the halfway point of St. Joseph Island. So the north half is included. We got west here to Nebish Island, Pine Island area, and then over to Deborah. This area that I'm circling now was kind of our original focus area. So this is where we focus our work. We would love to um, acquire a property with, you know, properties within here. This is where we do events participate in community events, that kind of thing. We will, you know, consider properties outside of this area um, if they are, you know, ecologically significant enough and not too far away. We won't say no strictly because they're outside of this boundary, but this is just kind of where we focus our work. So there's a bunch of different ways that we can acquire land. I'm going to go through a few of them here. So fee simple. This is the standard way that Owner, land ownership is done in Canada. Um, if you own a house or a cottage or a lot and you know you own it outright, you bought it or it was given to you, that's called fee simple ownership. So it allows for the owner to have basically complete control of the property that you know as long as it falls within the municipality's official plans and such, you can do whatever you want. You can cut down the trees, you can build a house, you can build trails, you can um, you know, invite your friends over, you can do all those kind of things. So all the nature preserves that we own are fee simple ownership. So the next we have conservation easements. So this is a little tricky to explain briefly, but if you own a property and you want to ensure that it is protected forever, but you don't want to give up your rights, you don't want to sell it or donate it, you can enter what's called a conservation easement with a land trust, so in this case, the Kensington Conservancy, where you um, negotiate a list of restrictions. So it, they can be whatever, you know, the negotiations come to, but often it's no development, no harvesting of natural resources, um, no mining, no agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, all kinds of things that would be harmful to the property. And then that agreement is signed by both the landowner and the 
the, uh, the uh, land trust and and then that actually goes on the deed and it's there forever so if the landowners were to sell the property or give it to somebody else those restrictions are still in place and um, so that allows the property to be protected forever so these are used a lot more in the us than canada they can be complicated if someone breaks conservation easement then you have to sue them and that costs money so if somebody says you know their conservation easement says they're not allowed to cut down a tree and then they go ahead anyway and cut down a tree or lots of trees and then we find out because we monitor these properties once a year then we have to take them to court because they broke that um, conservation easement um, split receding this is basically if you were to either sell if you were to sell a property to um, a land trust but you want to get some money but not all of it so let's say a property is worth hundred thousand dollars but you sell it to us for fifty thousand dollars you give us a deal then you will actually get a tax receipt for the remaining value fifty thousand dollars that you can use as if you um, donated fifty thousand dollars cash to us so it, you know it kind of benefits both parties it allows the land trust to get a deal on the purchase price and allows the seller to still get some of the value in uh, tax breaks. American Friends of Canadian Conservation. One issue is um, in Canada, there's American landowners who wish to donate land to a land trust. But when they do that, the tax receipt that they get is only can only be used against Canadian income. And a lot of Americans don't have Canadian income. So the way to get around this is to go through this organization where you donate the land to this um, to the American Friends of Canadian Conservation, and then they issue you that the American tax receipt. And then the or and then the American Friends of Canadian Conservation transfers it to the land trust in Canada. So it uh, it can be expensive to do. There are expenses that go along with this and it can take a lot of time, a lot more paperwork involved, but um, to get that tax receipt and to get the property protected, it is worth it. And then we have the Ecological Gifts Program. This is an, a program put on by Environment Canada, so the feds. Um, this allows for bigger tax credits. So if a property is deemed to be ecologically significant enough, you can donate it to an organization like the Kensington Conservancy through this program and you can get the full value of the property in tax breaks. So typically if you were to just straight donate a property to the Kensington Conservancy and let's say it's worth $100,000 again, you get a tax receipt for $100,000, but you don't get that full value back in taxes. Like if you were to donate $100 to a charity, you don't get $100 back from that on your tax return. You just get a portion of it. But if you go through the Ecological Gifts Program, you get that full value back in tax breaks. So it's, you know, it's not quite as good as cash, but uh, if you pay a lot of taxes, you can save a lot of money by doing this. And that is the Foster Parkland and Walking Trails, which I mentioned earlier, This they did donate it through this program. And then legacy gifts. If uh, you have a property that you wanna continue using now, but uh, upon your passing, you want it to make sure it's protected, you can leave um, your property in your will to the Kensington Conservancy or any kind of land trust. And then um, even if it's a property that isn't, doesn't have conservation values, let's say, just say it's your, your cottage, you could give that to us as well um, with the intentions of us selling it and using the proceeds to fund conservation work elsewhere. So seeing as this is a presentation for the Sioux Climate Hub, I just wanted to quickly tie in this to um, climate change. So um, Nature United, an organization here in Canada, that just actually released a study um, called Natural Climate Solutions. And it does get pretty technical. There's a lot of science behind it. But the gist is that uh, you know, a lot of the climate change can be fought by just protecting land, um, protecting forests, protecting wetlands, protecting grassland, protecting any kind of natural habitat um, can do a good when it comes to climate change. Even though the Kensington Conservancy, grand scheme of things, small scale, um, 
or, you know, a small organization, less than a thousand acres, you know, it all adds up all across Canada, all across the world. And uh, hopefully the more that land trusts, you know, do this kind of work, the more uh, we can fight climate change. So besides actually protecting land, uh, we do some other things as well in the community. So we have our hiking trails. If you haven't been on them yet and you're into hiking, I definitely suggest you go check these out. Um, it's about three and a half kilometers in length. The trailhead is located at 69 Border Drive, which is where the Kensington Conservation Center is. And they're a fantastic set of hiking trails that are open to the public 24 seven. There, it goes through a variety of habitats, mixed forest, open rock. There's the view at the bottom here is magnificent. Um, up in here is all hardwood forest. A view up here of the whole Deborah Portlock Flats area. Um, they are a little, the trails are a little bit rugged. They're you know not maybe not appropriate for anyone with mobility issues or young children. But for the most part, if you take your time, go slow. They're fantastic trails. Um, one project that we've done is the Stobie Creek Rehabilitation Project. The Stobie Creek, which flows you know into the Stobie Creek wetland, which I mentioned many times, um, goes through agricultural land and uh, is kind of you know not doing so well. Cattle were in the creek. There was a lot of agricultural runoff getting into it and the water quality was not good. So we actually received a grant from Trillium to do some engineer work to determine what needed to be done. And um, with leftover grant money, we were able to get started by fencing in the portions of Stobie Creek just south of the highway. So here's uh, some of the construction work starting on those fences. And here they are. So we were able to get the cattle out of the creek and there's already been uh, some, you know, huge improvements with the, the um, shoreline along the creek here since the cattle have been out. But we also installed these no pump, nose pumps so that the cattle still had access to the water. It's uh, pretty cool. They go, they push on this here in order to access the water, but by pushing it, it pumps more water in. So there's always water there for them. We, every year we run the Deborah Christmas bird count. Christmas bird counts take place all across North America every year during December and early January. And it's kind of gives a snapshot in time of where birds are each year. So we organize one here in Deborah every year. We do a lot of kids programming. Um, one is the Explore Summer Day Camp that we partner with the St. Joseph Highland Hunters and Anglers for. And it's a week long day camp where they do all kinds of fun outdoor activities, canoeing, archery. There's a picture of me taking them bird watching, play all kinds of outdoor games and stuff. And uh, we're actually excited to be doing that again this year after missing last year. We have it scheduled for the week of August 9th this year. Um, some other things that we do in here that I don't have slides for, we're currently working with the Tarbit Township for the rehabilitation of their WI Park at the south end of McLennan Road. It was a park that you know, wasn't really being used as park. So they've got grant money and partnered with us to turn it back into a park again, where people can look for nature, go swimming, have picnics and that kind of thing. Um, we do free guided tours on all of our properties so that people can check them out. Um, the, seeing as most of our properties are fairly sensitive, we don't want people going in on their own, but we still want people to enjoy them and check them out. So that's why we offer free guided tours. And that's all that I have for presentation this week. So thanks for listening. Um, here is my contact information, my email, my phone number, and then the address for the Conserva Kensington Conservation Center. The Kensington Conservation Center, we've actually been able to open it back up to the public again now. We're allowing one person from the public in at one time. So if you want to come check it out, learn more about what we do, definitely feel free to. So I'm going to stop my share here and open it up to any questions. Well, first of all, I want to say, Carter, that was awesome. I'm so excited just to hear what's in our area. And <laughs> I think you're the man. You've uh, only recently become the executive director. I think I read that it was March. So yeah. I think uh, you, were, uh, you were an excellent choice, if I may be so bold as to evaluate. And I love your enthusiasm. I think that through your eyes, we can see what we see every day, but we can see it with renewed eyes. And I think that is just brilliant. So many, many thanks to you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I invited people to uh, ask questions through the chat. The only question there is mine. So <laughs> I'm not having much to do there. And seeing as we're a small group, perhaps people, if they wish, could ask questions just directly. The one question I did ask is that you mentioned that you do maintenance on the properties that you acquire. And as I listen to you, I learn more about what maintenance is. And it's with the goal, I guess I could say, of enhancing its um, conservation value or its ecological right. value. What, what kinds of activities does that entail? I see that you fenced a creek and, uh, and still remembered the cattle. So that's a, probably yeah. an example. What other kinds of things? Yeah. You so, um, like there's basic maintenance, like, you know, our trails need trail maintenance. There's one property that's got a road through it. So there's road maintenance. But when it comes to actual like stewardship work, to be honest, we don't do a whole, whole lot because there, that work doesn't need to be done. The properties are in ecological health. There's barely any invasive species um, that need to be taken care of. There's no like grasslands that need to be restored. Um, I guess we did plant trees on the Archibald property, um, but by the time I started working for the Conservancy, they were big enough that they didn't need, you know, maintenance or monitoring anymore. They were big enough to grow on their own, but that's the kind of thing if we want, you know, if we acquired a property that had an old field in it that wasn't going to be hayed anymore, or maintained as a grassland, you know, we'd plant trees and maintain them. If um, we have installed bluebird boxes on a lot of our properties, so just to, um, you know, encourage some more birds nesting on our properties. The other, some, some land trusts do things like prescribed burns to um, deal, you know, to restore grasslands or um, restore forests that, you know, benefit from fires. There's all kinds of different things that we could do if necessary. We're just lucky right now that we don't need to do those things. Our properties are in good ecological health. Awesome. Cool. Do you have a volunteer contingent that you rely on to do some of this work? Um, kind of. Um, we're working on getting a better network of volunteers going. We've been successful at getting volunteers on an as-needed um, basis. Like if we're doing a tree planting, you know, we put out an ad for we need volunteers on this day. And we've been somewhat successful at getting people for those days. Um, right now, we're working on getting more of a network of volunteers that is, you know, more organized and not just for, for specific events. Um, we're, we're working on that. It's, it's difficult in a small community. There's a lot less people to draw from to start with. Um, you know, land trusts and southern Ontario that are in major population centers have way more people that are, you know, available to pull from. So we just, you know, less people here. And it seems like up here, there's less people as concerned about protecting the land that's here. I talked to a lot of people like, why are you protecting this land? There's trees everywhere. Um, so it's a little bit of a different mindset. In Southern Ontario, there's, you know, there's only limited green space left. So there's a lot of people trying to protect what's still there before it's gone. But up here, yeah, the mindset's a little different when this is not as urgent. We're doing it before it has to become urgent, but. Right. Are you part of a network then through say Nature Conservancy of Canada? We're, it's the Ontario Land Trust Alliance. Oh, right. Okay. So, who, the nature, because the Nature Conservancy of Canada is basically the same, does the same work that we do just on a national scale. They're just a massive land trust. So they are actually part of the Ontario Land Trust Alliance as well. But that, that's who we kind of network through. We go to a gathering every year with all the different land trusts and talk to them. That's where I learn a lot of that kind of Southern Ontario stuff from them. Right. And also, I guess having a large organization like that is really good for public outreach to start getting the message out too. Yeah. Uh, there is another question in the chat. And this is a very practical one. Bird boxes that you mentioned uh, the question is, do they need to be cleaned out annually? And do you look to volunteers to do that? Yes, so they do need to be cleaned out annually. And um, 
we do I do use both staff and volunteers to do that. So if someone's willing to do it, then happy to have them help. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. That would be fun. You also mentioned the hole in the wall, taking a boat up there. I know you, um, by offering guided tours, you protect the trail use. What about the water use or the shoreline use? So technically, like we have no control over the water, right? So mm -hmm. we can't prevent people from boating up into the hole in the wall because that's public, you know, whatever water falls under public property, you know. And right. then we technically can't um, stop someone from boating, you know, right along shore on the water beside one of our properties. Um, so yeah, technically those aren't protected or anything. We can, we try to do, you know, public education about good practices on the water um, kind of thing. You know, it's better to go out kayaking than boating or mm -hmm. kind of thing, but. Right, right. Oh. Okay, are we, do we have any others? Well, uh, I invite anybody in the audience if you have a question. I, there, there are none left in the chat box. And as I say, we're a small enough group that we can probably have a conversation. Could I ask uh, Carmen, that's uh, Jody Wildman. Hi. I, I was just I was trying to type something, but it was too long to to put in into it into a written chat box. Um, Carter, one of the things I'm wondering about is um, so on St. Joseph Island, for instance, where you don't have properties, um, but we do have a number of we have all, obviously a lot of uh, private landowners and and farmers, for instance, and the the thing that you did on Stobie Creek uh, interested me a bit in that. Um, the thing like where the, um, the nose pumps for the cattle, um, even if there was a farmer who didn't want to, who wanted to keep maintain their land themselves and, and had uh, farming there, would the Kensington Conservancy be available to help uh, private landowners with sort of best practices for how to be more environmentally friendly, uh, things like that, uh, municipalities as well, because we don't have the network or the expertise that that you might have um, to be able to share with people this is something you can do in your everyday life because i think that's some of the problems that that people have is what can i do to fight climate change it's too big for me to like the conceptually it's too big um but but if there was sort of yeah. everyday stuff that people could do in their own properties or whatever it might be um I think municipalities would love to have that that resource to be able to get the word out to people and try to um, focus on specific issues um, in a regular newsletter or things like that. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to help out with that. Um, we do have some of those things listed on our website already, like things that private landowners can do on their properties. There's probably a lot more things that we could list there as well. But yeah, for sure, we're definitely willing to work with uh, St. Joseph Township and any other township in our area to promote that kind of thing, for sure. Awesome idea. And thank you, Jody, for asking. Yeah, so Jody, if you want to reach out to me at some point, we can discuss that further. Definitely. Thank you. Well, here we are at 828. And again, I have a huge thank you to say to Carter and best wishes for the most wonderful year of your life, <laughs> your first year <laughs> as executive director and then continuing forever. That's um, thank you. And thank you for all the work that you and the Conservancy do. I think, as I said, it gives us great inspiration that it's through the actions of everyday people doing everyday things with an educated mind that will beat the issues of climate change. It's not the big colossal thing, it's the little things that we do incrementally. Thank you for pointing the way on that. 
Yeah, thanks for having me. This evening was fun. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and thank you, Alice, for being there. I want to wrap it up and invite people for August 25th. As I say, I can't yet say the uh, topic of the presentation, but I'm anticipating one and looking forward to it. We also have presentations lined up for September, October, and November. And if there's anyone who wishes to connect with us, join forces with us, add to the conversation, we are mo would most welcome to have you. So uh, thank you for this evening. Okay, uh, Carmen, be before we sign off, I just wanted to talk about our event for tomorrow. It'll only take two Absolutely, minutes or so. Absolutely, Tobin, thank you for jumping in. All right, may I take the stage? Yes. Well, before I, I um, move on to that, I just wanted to say that uh, Carter, uh, we'd be happy to help with uh, a call out for volunteers uh, through our, um, our, uh, our email listserv as well as our Facebook page. And there Thank might you. be people interested in town, so and uh, it definitely relates to climate change. So we'd be happy to to work with you. Thank you. Appreciate that. No problem. Okay, just bear with me while I uh, share my screen here, real quick. That's not right. Oh, there we go. Does it look good, Carmen? Okay, so um, Sorry, it's great. Yeah. Okay, good. So tomorrow, I know it's late notice, but uh, we're, we're holding a, an event called uh, Raise the Alarm on Climate Emergency. Um, it's part of a larger Canada wide um, uh, action that's uh, put on by uh, or being organized by 350.org, which some of you may know. Um, and the way we're doing it, we're basically, um, we're asking uh, people at 5 p.m. Um, wherever they are, if they could, if they could make a sign um, expressing their feelings on climate change, and take five minutes to make some some noise. Now, some people may not want to do this, especially if you're in a more rural area, it might not make a lot of sense. But where it can be effective is if, if you do um, uh, create a sign, if you um, take a photo of it, and you can email it to us at uh, SueClimatePub at gmail.com. Or even better, if you're active on Facebook, uh, if you could post a photo of your climate change or your sign demanding action on climate change, um, you know, it's a great way to reach people who might not otherwise be thinking about climate change. Um, but it can also inspire and embolden other people who might not be as bold as to speak out against the need for action on climate change. So you might inspire people, make them feel brave. And uh, climate change can be a bit of a downer. So it's good to let people, other people know that you're thinking about it. So they feel less alone in their, their worries about climate change. So I'm just gonna switch screens here a little bit if I can. Where am I? Okay. So this is a picture of the sign that we have in our front yard, short and simple. Um, but when we share it on Facebook, it'll reach other people in my community, our community that aren't connected with Sioux Climate Hub. And it can have a broader reach and get people thinking about climate change and uh, maybe joining a group like ours. So if you feel so inclined, we'd be happy uh, if you'd uh, make a sign like this, post it on your lawn just for an evening, take a photo of it and uh, either send us the photo or, or post it on Facebook or Twitter if you're a Twitter use, user. Um, and the, 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 the hashtags that are being associ associated with this uh, Canada-wide event is Canada is on fire. Hashtag Canada is on fire. Very apropos, I think, with the, the, the air quality we have uh, today. And um, uh, so if you wanna check it out, check out Canada is on fire. Uh, you can Google that and you'll find uh, more information about the national campaign, but it, uh, campaigns are going on across the country tomorrow. So um, I thought I'd plant that seed. So if anyone's interested, please feel free um, to to join us in this action. And uh, that's all I'm, all I'm going to say. Thanks so much.
Thank you, Tobin, for a really important message. I, as I said, it's the voices added together that make the large voice. So definitely. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, there's two more in there. Ah, yes. Awesome. All right, I will bid you good night. And thank you all for your help and for your attention and for spreading the word. And thank you, Carter, once again. Thanks. Have a good night.